usually I find that people are not serious, meaning they, they want an answer, but they don't want to do the work. Right. Yeah. Dr. Huberman's message is clear. Having dreams is great, but it's the effort that counts, you know? You can't escape hard work needed to achieve your goals, but you gotta be willing to accept those hits, to take them and make the first step. So let your dreams guide you, but let your actions define you. Believe in yourself, take action, and never give up, for that's the path to achieving your dreams. It's really simple. Can you not eat until 2 p.m.? Mm. I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not hungry in the morning. I'm like, great, drink coffee, drink water, and in the morning, get up and just get on, either run or get on some exercise bike and just pedal like someone's chasing you with a syringe full of poison. So, I mean, and the reason I felt any, uh, you know, uh, sense of agency in giving this information is, yeah, I've done a bunch of different things in neuroscience related to vision and neuroplasticity and stress, but I, I've done some work and continue to do some work with special operations and some of these groups that are interested in how you use biology to improve human performance mm -hmm. over long periods of time. Okay, so you know, basketball players, you know, yes, military, yes. you know, these kinds of things. Um, and so there's a pretty straightforward formula where when you've been asleep all night, your fuel reserves, like you've got fuel in your fat, you, know, you guys don't have any of that, but you got fuel in your fat, you've got fuel in your muscles that can be burned and you got fuel in your liver, it's called glycogen. And when you wake up early, all of that is as low as it's going to be because you haven't been eating anything. Gotcha. And so if you exercise then, your body starts dropping into your body fat stores quicker. Look, do it fasted and then continue to hydrate and then eat your first meal in the afternoon. Dr. Huberman knows the importance of starting your engine in the morning to get rid of unwanted fat. Working with special operations, he understands the need to move and burn fuel. In this video, you're going to discover why it's crucial to kickstart your metabolism early. Very few people can just take the, the menu and just do it, Go. right? Right. The beauty of being young is that neuroplasticity, your nervous system's ability to change mm -hmm. in response to experience to learn things, mm -hmm. is at its absolute peak. Mm -hmm. However, you don't have that much control over your life when you're young, right? Especially when you're really young. As you get older, it gets harder to change your nervous system, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. But the advantage you have is that you can direct exactly what changes you want to happen. Mm. And so there are two different ways to change your nervous system, depending on whether or not you're younger or you're older. And it's not like the gate drops right at 25. Okay. It just tapers off. If somebody is an adult, you can't change their mind. Right. You literally can't. They have to make the decision to do that. Parallel pathways, as the name suggests, are pathways. They could be neural pathways or hormonal pathways or otherwise that operate independently of one another to accomplish a common goal. First of all, I'm a big uh, proponent and consumer of yerba mate. Yerba mate is a tea that can promote the release of glucagon-like peptide one. And there are also new prescription drugs that are now hitting the market and for which there are really impressive clinical trials for diabetes and obesity that are essentially glucagon-like peptide one stimulator. So they stimulate the release of that, or they are in fact a synthetic version of glucagon-like peptide one. What is glucagon-like peptide one? It is a peptide, which is a small little protein that can dramatically suppress appetite. So that's why these drugs are being explored and are showing quite impressive results for things like treatment of type two diabetes and other forms of diabetes, as well as obesity. So they lead to weight loss. Now, in terms of the yerba mate stimulation of glucagon-like peptide one, that's gonna be a much lower amount of glucagon-like peptide one that's released from drinking yerba mate, as opposed to say, taking a drug that stimulates GLP-1 or taking a drug that is GLP-1. Nonetheless, I should also point out that yerba mate comes in a bunch of different forms. There is some concern about certain smoky flavored forms of yerba mate being carcinogenic. So that's why I avoid those forms of yerba mate. But for me, yerba mate is one of the preferred sources of caffeine. For me, I like the way it tastes. It does provide that sort of caffeine kick that I like to have early in the day for focus and for work and for exercise. And yet I actively avoid the smoked varieties of yerba mate because of the potential carcinogenic effects of the smoked varieties. Glucagon-like peptide one, as I mentioned earlier, can suppress appetite it does that by at least two mechanisms through parallel pathways. Glucagon-like peptide 
One acts on receptors in the body in a portion of the nervous system called the enteric nervous system. This is a component of your nervous system that you don't really have control over. It's autonomic or automatic. GLP-1 binds to what are called intestinofugal enteric neurons. You don't need to know the name, but those neurons do two things. First of all, they cause some gut distension. So they actually make you feel full. This is incredible, right? A peptide, not actual physical food, but a peptide that stimulates neurons that cause changes in the so-called mechanoreceptors of the gut of the enteric nervous system and make people feel full. So it can lead to actually mild, or I suppose if levels of GLP-1 are very high to major gut distension. Okay, I think that the levels of GLP-1 that would come from drinking yerba mate and hopefully from appropriate dosaging of the synthetic forms of GLP-1 or drugs that stimulate GLP-1 would cause mild, not major gut distension because major gut distension would be uncomfortable. So GLP-1 is acting at the level of gut to increase gut distension and by way of a pathway that goes from the gut up to the hypothalamus, this little cluster of neurons about the size of a marble that sits above the roof of your mouth is also suppressing appetite through brain mechanisms. So this is really beautiful, right? You have a peptide, a small little protein that's released in the gut and that release within the gut causes gut distension, which makes you feel full and by way of neural stimulation of the hypothalamus also activates neural pathways within the brain that trigger satiety, the feeling of having had enough food. So to me, GLP-1 is both impressive and important. Why? Because this recent category of drugs that's now hitting the market seems to adjust obesity or can help people with weight loss in order to help their health. And it's doing so by at least two mechanisms. One is within the brain and the other is within the gut and communication through the so-called gut-brain axis. But at the same time, things like yerba mate, and I'm sure there are other compounds out there as well, but certainly yerba mate can stimulate the release of GLP-1. So for those of you that are looking for some mild appetite suppression and want to accomplish that while also ingesting caffeine, yerba mate might be a good option for that. And then for everybody, not just those that are interested in appetite suppression, I think it's important to understand that these parallel pathways are fundamental to how we are organized. Another good example of this would be when we are excited by something, positive or negative, so it could be stressful or we're positively aroused, there is a parallel activation of epinephrine, adrenaline, both from your adrenals and from an area in the brain called the locus ceruleus. So again and again, we see this in biology and in neuroscience, that your brain and your body are acting in concert. They're acting together through mechanisms that either are independent, so separately in the brain and separately in the body, but directed towards a common goal or through communication between brain and body. And almost always that communication is going to be bi-directional body to brain and brain to body. Most of what you see out there on the internet focuses more on what you could eat and should eat or shouldn't eat. It concentrates on exercise, but the burn factor, your thermogenic environment is one of the, if not the most important factors in this business of fat loss. What I'd like you to know is that this is a two-part process. One is fat mobilization, and the second is fat oxidation or utilization, okay? So the first thing that has to happen for body fat to get burned up or used and reduced is that it has to get mobilized. You just have to move that fat out of the position that it's in. You have to get it out of the fat cells, all right? Fat cells can be visceral around our viscera, our organs, or they can be subcutaneous under our skin. So here's the deal. Basically stored fat has two parts that are relevant here. It's got the fatty acid part, and that's the part that your body can use. And that's attached to something called glycerol, and they're linked by a backbone. So the first step is to get those fatty acids moving around in the bloodstream, to get them out of those fat cells. And then they can travel and be used for energy. And the second part is oxidation, is then those fatty acids, those are potential fuel. They're just potential fuel, but you haven't burned the fat yet. You've just moved it out of your fat cells. They're going to go into cells that can use them for energy. And once they are inside those cells, they're still not burned up. You need to oxidize them. You think oxidation is the burn up part. They need to be moved into the mitochondria and then they can be converted into ATP, into energy. 
So just to really zoom out again to make sure I don't lose anybody, you got to mobilize the fat, then you have to oxidize the fat. You have to, in other words, you have to mobilize it, then you actually have to convert it into energy. So let's talk about how to use cold and how to leverage shiver as a particularly strong stimulus to increase fat loss mo through mobilization and oxidation of these fatty acids. So in recent years, there's been a growing interest in the use of cold for various things like improving stress tolerance, improving metabolism, recovery from exercise. But most people out there are using cold exposure, typically by taking cold showers or by getting into cold water of some other kind, a lake or a river or a cold bath or an ice bath. And they are doing that probably with mixed goals, meaning they both would like to increase their metabolism and burn fat as well as improve mental resilience. So we have several kinds of fat, three kinds in fact. We have white fat, white adipose tissue, and we have brown fat or brown adipose tissue. And there's a third kind which is beige adipose tissue. White fat is the type that we traditionally think of as fat, subcutaneous fat. And it is not particularly rich in mitochondria, it is there as an energy storage site and we have to mobilize the fat out, as we talked about before, and burn it up elsewhere. Brown fat largely exists between our shoulder blades and on the back of our neck, and it's rich with mitochondria, which is why it's called brown fat. Beige fat is sort of in between. It's white fat that could be brown fat because it has some mitochondria in it, but not as many as brown fat. Now, cold exposure does several things. Making ourselves cold can allow us to build up mental resilience because getting into cold of any kind, doesn't matter if it's a cryo chamber, doesn't matter if it's a cold day and you forgot your sweater or your parka, it doesn't matter if it's an ice bath or you, you're lying down in the snow. Cold causes the release of adrenaline from your adrenals and it causes the release of epinephrine from these neurons that connect to fat. Now, the big effects of cold on metabolism and fat burning are going to be through two routes. One is that if you expose yourself to cold, you have the opportunity to trigger activation of brown fat as well as to convert more beige fat into true brown fat. So you essentially create a stronger or a hotter furnace. That's the way to think about brown fat. It's like a furnace. And so with this principle that we started with of calories in versus calories burned, what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of burning, you're increasing the burn of energy by increasing the intensity of the heat inside you, so to speak. No matter who you are, it's probably not a good idea to be really large. It's actually any large animal lives less long than hmm. the smaller version of that same animal. And it's because of the dosing of this one gene called insulin growth factor. Okay. So uh, Andre the Giant died young. Mm. Uh, people that have acromegaly, you know, the, the forehead yes. ridge and the huge Big. hands, they don't live very long mm -hmm. because right. all their organs are huge. Everything that extends your life right. has to do with keeping a lighter weight. Mm. Now, there's nothing wrong I with putting on a little bit of extra muscle if you want to be stronger for whatever reason. Yeah. But when you get past a certain point, it does shorten your life. There's right. no question right. about it because it's like mm -hmm. a second puberty. Yeah. Right. And the fastest rate of aging that you will ever go through at any stage mm -hmm. is puberty. Mm -hmm.